great to see a tremendous wow. crowd here today for this exciting panel that we're having. And I'm, I will introduce our panelists here in a second, but just to check to make sure you're in the right place. This is Equity for All Children, Four Funders, Four Approaches. And I couldn't be more excited to be the moderator for today's interesting conversation. I'm brand new. My name is Kyle Peterson. I'm the new executive director of the Walton Family Foundation. I started six months ago, almost to the day, and I heard about this particular uh, panel about a week after that, and I said, I want to do that. I actually went to graduate school here in Texas, University of Texas, many, many years ago, and I have a huge fondness for UT and Austin, so I wanted to be here. But this is really kind of my first public debut, if you will, or kind of coming out uh, here with the Walton Family Foundation. And I think it's important because it's around the topic that is incredibly uh, important to all of us, and that is, you know, equity for kids. Um, so there's a new beginning for me. There are new beginnings here for panelists. Uh, Carla, who will introduce, just came out with a, a fantastic new annual report. So you should all go to the Kellogg Foundation website and check out the new annual, annual report. It's all about equity with families and kids and communities. Hillary from the Ford Foundation uh, is, will talk about a new strategy that they actually are going to be launching and she'll, uh, in the next few months. And with Sarah from the Gates Foundation, they have a new education leader. So there's all sorts of new things that are going on. Um, I've had the great pleasure in the last few weeks of talking to each of the panelists and hearing a bit about the work that they're doing and how that work is evolving. And you know, one thing I know for sure, we, have, we may have different approaches and how we do this work, but the principles behind the work, the objectives that we have are exactly the same. And we're looking out for kids, particularly kids who are the most vulnerable in the United States and beyond in some cases. And uh, really the purpose of today is for all of you to hear about these evolving strategies and for you to ask some questions at the end. My job as a moderator for you today is to help in a really, I think, informal way to engage with our panelists so you can hear about the work. So with that, it's my grand pleasure to introduce our three panelists. First, we have Carla Thompson Payton, and she is a vice president uh, of program strategy at the Kellogg Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And she manages the team on education, economic security, leadership, and more. She brings a tremendous background. She actually was in the Obama administration, where she was the deputy director of the Office of Child Care. So welcome, Carla. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Hillary Pennington is, listen to this, as a title, as, imagine having this title, Vice President of Education, Creativity, and Free Expression. At the Ford Foundation. That's awesome, by the <laughs> way. Awesome. We can kind of stop the whole panel right now. And she is a, a nationally renowned expert on post-secondary education. She has worked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also for the Center for American Progress and some other great institutions. Let's welcome Hillary. Thank you. And we have Sarah on the end, Sarah Allen. Sarah, uh, I have to say thank you to you. You've stepped in. We had Don Shalvey, who's, if you know Don at the Gates Foundation, he has the flu. So he's in bed today, and Sarah is here with us, and I think we're very excited about that. And she is Deputy Director of U.S. Programs for the Gates Foundation, and she has a focus on uh, improving college and career readiness uh, for K-12 students. She has a career working in the public school system in Portland, and also as a strategy consultant. So let's welcome Sarah. So I think we should just jump in with some questions. Um, I think the first one, there's lots of conversation about the issue of equity overall. 
There's lots of conversations specifically about equity in education and what that means for kids. As I've had conversations with Carla, Hillary, and Sarah, you know, there's really fascinating definitions for what equity for kids actually means. So I thought we would just start off and say, how do you, how do each of you, in your institutions, define equity, and how does that affect the grant making to create a, a more equitable future of kids in the US? Carla, do you want to start off with that? Sure. So good afternoon, everyone. These are educators. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So the Kellogg Foundation has long had a commitment to racial equity and healing. And we don't separate the two. For us, it's around breaking down the systemic and institutional barriers that prohibit children from thriving, be it based on their race, their language, their culture. And so for us, we think about equity in every single aspect. And we call it the DNA of the Kellogg Foundation. So, our board, our staff, and the communities that we work in are all reflective of the communities that we serve. And so about 10 years ago, our board doubled down on their commitment of being racial, a racial equity organization focused on healing. Because we recognize that although we could break down all of the silos, we can advocate for that, we could put funding in communities, we can bring people together to try to have understanding, without the aspect of healing, we actually couldn't move forward as a collective. And so for us, it's around ensuring that children have great access to high quality early childhood educational opportunities, along with the other areas that we focused on in health, workforce development, leadership. But for their education portfolio, it's particularly important. We want families to be able to choose the best, the best educational opportunities for their kids. And we don't want them to be stopped because of their racial composition, because of their socioeconomic status, because of where they live in the country. We want them to be able to go anywhere they want and have access. And so for us, it's around ensuring that we're good partners with our local community to break down the silos, address the systemic issues, and ensure that all children thrive. Um, I noticed, again, I made a mention of the annual report, and you have this very interesting triangle of mm -hmm. kids. Thriving children. Thriving children. Working, working families, families. Equitable communities. And so that's how we target every single grant-making opportunity that we have within the foundation. And for us, it's to constantly leverage what we know, what we're learning, so that we can support families and communities in making the changes for themselves. The Kellogg Foundation believes that we don't come in telling folks what to do. Our founder, Will Keith Kellogg, was a firm believer that communities have the answers to their own problems. The only thing that the Kellogg Foundation should be is a good partner. And so we try to be good partners with the communities that we serve. Every single grant that we support is community designed and community led. And therefore, in that, we're able to have conversations around what are the barriers that they're facing, and then therefore, how can we be good partners in leveraging their voice and supporting them as they go along their quest to resolve these issues so that their children can be best supported. Thank you. Hillary. So I think the way that I would come at equity is to say we know that talent and intelligence are equally distributed in the population. So no child uh, should have their, their access to opportunity or their ability to achieve their potential be limited by the color of their skin, the place they were born. Um, so that, at its fundamental root, is how we think about equity. Like Kellogg, we have a long tradition of funding um, people and communities who are closest to the problems that the Ford Foundation seeks to solve. And we're a global foundation. So we work not only in the US, but also around the world. And uh, we got a new president about three years ago, and we have, as an institution, been thinking a lot about how to take our mission forward, and uh, especially in light of the changes in the world that we, we live in. And we have decided to put a sole focus on the issues of inequality, and that's changed everything about our grant making. Ford, for many, many years in education, funded um, women's studies. We've, we, uh, you know, we, funded things that, we funded things in the arts and education that we will not fund now because of a focus on inequality. And because we're 80 years old, we had to take, undertake a pretty humbling exercise, looking back at the 80 years of the foundation mm -hmm. to realize we have not actually solved any of the problems of social justice that the foundation has been working on for its history. And that led us to say, um, actually, that the nature of social justice work is very different than um, the more technical work, which is also important and necessary and complementary, figuring out things like standards 
assessments, teacher development, adaptive learning, we had to ask ourselves, what is it about inequality that causes it, causes it to repeat itself, to perpetuate itself? Why does that happen? Why is it that when there's a social justice victory for every victory that's won, there's a reaction against that victory, which is you know, the nature of social justice work? And so for us, we, um, we have built our new strategies around an assessment of what we call internal to the foundation the drivers of inequality. Some of them are things you read a lot about in the newspaper these days, political representation, economic inequality. But two other aspects of inequality that are very central in our work are um, the inequalities that have to do with, dis with structural discrimination and racism, all the isms that we all know, and then the kinds of cultural narratives that are used to, um, to justify and normalize exclusion. And so we've become much, much more focused on um, issues of narrative. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, it's been a very, very profound shift. And so we've been taking each of the areas of grant making in the foundation and working through what it means to change them to bring that work more, um, more centrally to what we do. Thank you, sir. Sarah. Hi, everyone. I um, just want to say, for those of you who thought you were coming to see Don Shelby, I'm sorry, I know I'm a weak For those of you who know Don, he's always <laughs> got really uh, interesting insights there, but I'll try to do my best. Um, so if you were to come and visit us at the Gates Foundation, you'd see on the wall um, our mission statement, which is that every person deserves to live a happy life. And, you know, our co-chairs are constantly challenging us to think of that mission as translating it to action by focusing on our role in serving the needs of the marginalized. That takes various forms around the world. A huge portion of our work is actually overseen in global health and development. But in the United States, our program has always been focused on education as the key lever for building bridges of opportunity for low income and minority youth to gain access to the opportunities they need and the need in life um, to be on a path to a healthy, productive life. I would say, though, that we've, you know, we've, we are really still on a journey to figure out how to take that loft and really embed it, embed a, a very laser-focused action to how we actually go about work. And that's, that's a journey we're going to be on for a while. Um, you know, we have, as Hillary mentioned, focused on some universal type um, interventions, higher standards for all, um, teacher effect, access to high quality. Um, and that has always had an equity intent, but we are now really um, doubling down on reflecting deeply on how do we make sure that we are being very targeted? How do we work much more closely in local communities to ensure that the work we're funding is truly impacting the students uh, who need it the most? And uh, you know, we're really interested actually in learning from others who have been at this work longer uh, to help us really ensure that we are truly bringing an equity lens to all of our grant making work. That's the challenge. Thank you, Sarah. And we're excited that you're here. Um, you know, one of the great pleasures that I've had as being new to the Walton Family Foundation is just to hear some of the stories of the family. And, you know, listening to family members talk about Sam and Helen Walton and what they thought about education as really being the bedrock to actually, you know, uh, opportunity and to prosperity, and that really being kind of key, and access, particularly for those who are most vulnerable, access to uh, the best schools, the highest quality schools that kids can have in places that's tough to actually deliver that. And just hearing those stories, not just from Sam and Helen, but also from other family members, like John Walton, who uh, died 10 years ago, but somebody who really, I think, you know, worked with the family and set the family on a, on a strong path of focusing on education. So it's been a great pleasure just to learn the history of how important equity in education is to the family. So what's interesting is, you know, as I've uh, come to understand the strategies and the ones that are evolving, we focus in on different age groups for, you know, the goal of, of equity in education. And I'd love to hear a little bit about where you were and where you're going. Okay, because I think it's changing for a number of you. We're like, what the focus has been in terms of the age range for your focused efforts. So maybe start with Sarah. Uh, so for, 
For the past 16 years, the foundation has had um, a focus in K-12 and um, also a focus and really trying to think about how to support the point at post-secondary success um, earliest grade. Uh, we are continuing to focus primarily in grades 6, six through 12, higher ed. Um, but we're thinking a lot about how to integrate, uh, you know, how we can think about that as a more integrated so that, there are, so that we're focusing on the journey that students follow along their pathway through 12 into post-secondary ID. Focusing on where are the sort of points of momentum and loss, barriers that are in the way, helping students really that that those stages of, of their and by being a bit more focused on that, we and, and also on the, the transition spaces in between, uh, we think there's an opportunity to really prove out for color and scores. We also have a nascent early learning strategy. It's a um, new area of focus for us that has grown out of our work. In Washington. State, uh, that's primarily focused currently on pre-K, and we're interested in um, expanding that over the next years and partners with others to that, that end of the Great. Hillary, why don't you talk about the evolution, because I think it's pretty dramatic what you've been learning. Okay. Um, so when uh, our recent work at the Foundation in Education uh, focused on three things, um, K-12, and there we had an initiative called More and Better Learning Time, which was really about expanding the, um, the school day to bring uh, many of the services that middle and upper income families can buy for their children back into public schools. We also focused on higher education, um, access and success in higher education, and then a, a great deal of really important and innovative work, which we will continue on um, education for people who are incarcerated. And, uh, as we began to look at our inequality focus and we began to ask ourselves hard questions about what are, what does, the, where can we add our greatest, um, our greatest contribution given what everyone else is doing, yeah. we ended up deciding, you know, we don't really add a lot of value in the, in the whole kind of conversation about um, new forms of school models. And we don't really have the resources to make a big impact on systems change and systems improvements especially when we think about what we do around the world. You know, we really shouldn't be in our grant making focused on things that governments do, whether they're state or local or national governments. And, um, and maybe we don't have the resources to work across the huge spectrum that we have been working on. So we are making a pivot, and we're focusing on um, young people from the ages between 10 and 24. And we're thinking about, it, we're looking at all the evidence that says that is now what one could call the period of adolescence. And we really, really, really don't understand adolescence very well. Um, so part of what we feel we can do, particularly when we look at um, children and young people who come into systems bearing the effects of trauma, of poverty, of migration, um, that, that the systems aren't well equipped to see. How could we put the lived experience of those young people at the center of the education systems um, and other social systems that support them? So part of what we will focus on is actually trying to bring some of the best research about adolescent development, about brain development, into youth serving um, organizations. And then to uh, have a focus on the, the practices in uh, schools or cultures that push children out, your young people out, and then those that, that kind of um, pull them through, keep them attached and move them forward. So what those, what those look like in different cultures can vary. You know, in the US, it might be excessive school discipline um, kinds of policies. In many parts of the world where we work, the things that push people out of, young people out of school are things like early, early child marriage. So we're trying to stay focused on um, things that would be central regardless of where we work, and then to partner with others who are doing the more systems change kind of work to bring that knowledge to bear. And, to stay focused more on the principles of what makes for an effective um, learning experience for young people, rather than particular models or particular tools mm -hmm. or particular approaches. I would imagine a big part of this new strategy, though, is also out of school, right? Yes. In terms of the influence of friends, parents, yes. and media, et cetera. Yes, very much so. And, yes, and all of the informal opportunities for development that are really the, the majority of time for most young people as they as they grow up. Carla, talk about like, what, what age range do you focus on? Sure, so in the history of the Kellogg Foundation, we have focused across the age spectrum. 
for education, but in more recent years, like the last 20 years, we focus solely on early childhood education. And the Kellogg Foundation defines early childhood education as infant toddler programs to age eight or birth to third grade. And we decided to do that based on research, based on the lessons learned from our historic grant making around where could we make the most difference in the life of a child in their education cycle. And we recognized that we didn't have the resources to work across the full spectrum, but we could double down on early childhood and really focus on those earliest years because we knew that kids who were not successful past the third grade were more likely to drop out of school. And we said, what can we do that can be more preventative than reactionary or trying to remediate? And so we focused on early childhood. But the way in which we focus on early childhood is through a variety of ways. One, it's around family engagement. Because we are the firm believers that children do not live outside of the context of their families. And so you can put in all the resources into having high quality early childhood experiences. But if their families aren't actively engaged, you're actually not moving that needle. And so we have a strong component around family engagement, around educating families around the importance of early childhood education helping them to learn how to advocate on behalf of their child and the children in their community, and then giving them voice in around what are the things that are important for their children to know in their education journey. We also focus on what we call effective teaching. And a lot of our grant making is on both pre-service and in-service professional development for teachers and principal leadership. Because we recognize that for as great as our higher ed institutions are, you actually don't quite know what to expect until you're in the classroom facing that child. And rather than in many of the public education systems that we support have only five days of professional development, we wanted embedded professional development throughout the cycle. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our grant making was around creating opportunities to release teachers from classroom time so that they would have small group learning communities to really figure out how can they enhance their practice in the classroom in the immediacy, as opposed to waiting until certain times of the year. And so across the country, we've been funding within that pre-service, in-service training model. And then we also focus on the alignment of public systems. We recognize for early childhood, it's very fragmented. There isn't a single financing structure that supports early childhood. It's a hodgepodge of many types of funding streams coming together. Some are very successful, some not so much. We wanted to be able to advocate on behalf of young children saying that we need to have some sort of public mechanism that supports early childhood, be it from a local, state, or federal level. And so we worked with a variety of partners at all of those levels to try to figure out what's the best way to blend and braid funding so that there's high quality experiences. And so a lot of our work has been in partnerships with states and the federal government around providing that soft money that allows for flexibility and innovation within early childhood programs. Thinking about some of the kindergarten readiness tools, thinking about some of the other assessments that are used, focusing on high quality infant toddler care and trying to figure out how we can have better cost structures so that it doesn't cost the family ten to $15,000 a year for high quality early childhood and infant care, and then figuring out how do we support pre-K and what are the bridges that we can build between a high quality pre-K system and the K-12 system. And then in the K-3 space, what can we do so that we won't lose the gains of a high quality early childhood program, but also support the structure so that the best thinking in early childhood goes through the entire K-12 continuum and you don't start to see the roll off of some of the value set that early childhood has. And so we focus a lot of our energy in early childhood. We also have some specialized programs, what we call in our places. And so we have generational commitments to the state of Mississippi, New Mexico, the city of New Orleans, the state of Michigan, which is our home state, and we do generational grant making. So we have an office in each one of those places. And for us, it's around having community response and activity helping us to determine our grant making. Now we keep to our structure of what we believe is right for early childhood, but we also try to make sure that we're addressing the needs of the community. And so for instance, in New Mexico, it's about language preservation because a lot of the Native American communities in Pueblos are losing their native language. And so we've decided, what can we do to support language preservation within the early childhood system? 
We've done that also in the state of Hawaii, and through our advocacy and through the support of starting an early childhood office in the governor's office, we were able to get language preservation to be part of their standard federal, standard state funding stream so that all schools would have access to language preservation resources. And so those are some of the ways in which we engage community to try to figure out what do we need to do to ensure that children, regardless of the language they speak, regardless of where they live, Everything about what makes them unique is respected and supported. Mm. But, you know, I think it's fantastic that you're you know, advocating to states and to cities on, on early childhood education. I imagine you also work with other funders, right? Because Absolutely. I think funders really have been, this is where philanthropy, I think, has really shown in actually making this issue that's possible, right, to actually invest and have real results. So I, who are you working with in many of the states that you've been talking about? So there's no one that we won't work with. <laughs> the problem with philanthropy is that we're so busy doing our work, we're not very intentional about working with our partners. But for early childhood in specific, specifically, we're a part of every single funding collaborative. So the Early Childhood Funding Collaborative, the Education Funding Collaborative, some ad hoc groups, all thinking about how can we partner. So we've been working with Sour Weber at the Gates Foundation around the work that they're doing with their new Early Childhood Initiative. We have been working with the Pritzker Foundation. Next week I'll be with them talking about some ways in which we can pool our resources to do some collaborative work around early childhood. And so there's not a funder that we won't work with. If anyone off the street says, hey, how can we be helpful? We'll try to figure out a way to be helpful. But I think in philanthropy, it's one of the opportunities for all of us to be more intentional around how we're working together. We're great about talking about how we support each other through our grantees, but we need to be a little bit more proactive on yeah. how we work together, thinking about initiatives moving forward and what are some of the opportunities. We're great with you know, partnering across, you know, I'm working in early childhood, Gates is working in K-12. We talk about that, but I think there's still more opportunity and some things that we can do to make that relationship even stronger. It takes time, well, that's the thing. It takes but, time. But it, but it pays off. It right? does, absolutely. And it's not just like once you finish your strategies and then saying, hey, look at this, do you want to partner? We probably should be talking when we're creating our strategies, right? Absolutely, and I think we do talk. And the one thing I can say that there's not a time that I've, not, I've picked up the phone and called a philanthropic partner that my call hasn't been received and a really rich discussion around what we could do together collaboratively hasn't been accepted. So I just think we need to take advantage of those opportunities even more. So by the way, so we're going to have time for questions in a few minutes. You can get on to Slido, and that is a, an app that you can actually uh, tap into. You can download that. You can actually add questions, and you should put that for Salon H. Okay, we'll be looking at that in a few minutes for questions. So, Carla, you mentioned a couple places where you're focusing your efforts. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing the same thing. We've been focusing in about a dozen cities in particular. You also have a strong focus in our, our home region, where I've just moved to in, in northwest Arkansas, also the Delta. So we've focused our geographic footprint. And I think what's interesting in talking with each of you, the geography, kind of where your focus, whether it's urban or rural, is changing. So maybe, you know, Hillary and Sarah, mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, we are, um, you know, the Ford Foundation for many, many years was actually structured so that we had a rural division and an urban division. Uh, that changed about 10 years ago, and, uh, and the foundation's work has become more focused on urban areas, in part because we work in places like China and India, you know, where there's such massive movements of people uh, into urban areas. So we won't change that, but we are trying to look more at the nature of geography, the geography of opportunity. Um, a lot of the work that Raj Chetty and others have done, you know, really um, for us, trying to focus most primarily on where the greatest inequalities are, which would lead you to look at the, at the South, as we were talking about earlier. Um, particularly in the work that we've done on mass incarceration, I won't get the statistics exactly right, but it's a tiny handful of cities and neighborhoods in those cities that will be receiving the, the vast majority of people who um, return to their communities after their, their um, periods of incarceration are over. So we're looking a lot at that and trying to figure out how we can, um, the, the work that we've been doing in uh, well, prison education has focused on the last two years of someone's sentence and then the first two years after their release. And so we're trying to think about how to help make those transitions. 
um, more powerful, more effective. So geography factors in in that, in that sense too. And, and then as we were talking about before, states matter. They matter a lot. Yeah. Um, they're going to matter a lot uh, at, um, in these next years. And so really trying to understand where the laboratories for certain kinds of policies or innovations can be is something we're interested in and interested in learning from funders that are further down that path than we are. Yeah, I think similarly, we, um, while we have always had national components to our strategy and we'll continue to do around how we use voice um, and in, in searching out new innovations, uh, we too are thinking a lot about how to work in a more place-based, responsive way. Um, look for, you know, we have certain states where we've prioritized past a lot of our grant making that has been a bit um, related most to the conditions in those places, receptive, et cetera. I think we're bringing a new lens to that now, which is really to look much more int uh, uh, intentionally at where are the populations of students that we focus on, black and Latino students, English learners. Uh, and that leads you to places like California, south to Florida, um, as well as um, places like New York. I don't think we will, we are trying to be very um, adaptive to local conditions. So I think where in the past we might have said, well, we're just going to focus on urban environments. Now we're thinking a lot more about well, where are the students that serve, and that may be a more rural footprint state, uh, whereas it may be more urban. And so uh, trying to think about different approaches that, that fit to the context um, so that we are continually trying to get um, the support that's needed to those communities, uh, but you know, think about different, different approaches. Carla, did you want to add anything about geography? Well, you mentioned kind of your key areas, but you also work. Yeah, we work in every across, state. We work in every single state. We work in Mexico and we work in Haiti. And at any time, anyone can put in an application on our website. We don't have a solicitation process. We say, if you have a great idea, put it on the web, fill out the application on our website, and we will have a conversation with you. We do also have some historic grant making that we've done in South Africa, Brazil, Costa Rica, and some other countries where that's more invitation only. But for the concrete work that we're doing around early childhood, around health and those things, it's Mexico, Haiti, and all 50 states. Our place-based strategy is our generational commitment where we said, we will have offices in these places, we will have staff from these places, and we will have at least a generational commitment to ensuring that all of the strategies that we've developed in collaboration with our grantees can come to fruition. And so, that's our process. And you've mentioned the generational yes. issue, I think, a couple times. And it's yeah. interesting, because I think, you know, with place-based work, where a lot of foundations are moving, because that's where you can be much more intense. Mm -hmm. This work is relational. It is. Community-based. It is. You have to understand the context. So and you have, have to you have show to the there. partnership and that you're willing to be there whether things are working well or not, and that you're going to be there through the cycle and the tides of change. And that's why we talk about our place-based strategy as being generational, and it's why we have offices there and staff that are located there, because we really want the community to recognize that we're not just coming in trying to make a change. We are a part of that community, and the, the, the success of that community is equally important to us. Can I say something a little contrarian yeah. on this? So mm -hmm. I think places matter. I think it is very, very easy for there to be inequities that happen in philanthropy about place. Yes. So there are certain um, parts of the country and certain cities that get chosen over and over again. Mm -hmm. I think national foundations could be a lot better than we, we are, mm -hmm. I'll speak for ours, at um, partnering with regional funders and local funders and coming in behind them. Yes. And in particular, um, I think it can be a bad thing when foundations cook up some kind of an initiative and then Leave. put out a, a request for proposal saying dangling money you know, mm -hmm. to a city to say, if you want to do this, we'll consider you, mm -hmm. rather than having the city yeah. say, this is what we are doing, mm -hmm. and we'll take your, we'll take your money if you, if you help mm -hmm. us. So I think we all need to get a lot better at that. And while I feel it's a great thing to hear, these conversations, yeah. particularly with the large resources of, of the institutions represented here, um, it's also really important to be thinking about local capacity and yeah. local, um, local leadership. And Absolutely. that's a hard thing to do, for, uh, in my experience. Yeah, and we've struggled with it at the Kellogg Foundation. 
And we will say that we've had missteps over yeah, our 85 year history, but we've learned from those missteps. And that's why when we decided to go to a place-based strategy about 10, 15 years ago, we said we have to have a very different approach and it has to be collaborative and it has to be in partnership. And so every other year we have what we call community conversations where we go out to those communities and say, okay, grantees, key stakeholders, come and tell us, are we on target? Are we missing the mark? What should we be paying attention to? You know, what is it that we're doing that's hindering your progress? And we use that to refine our strategy. And so we just did that about a year ago. And not all of it was good. And we had to really think about what are we doing in these communities? Even though we reside there and we're a part of those communities, you know, are, are the resources that we're bringing in feeling like parachute resources? Yeah. What are we doing around partnerships at the local level with other? So take, for instance, New Mexico. We're the largest funder in New Mexico. But we have to build capacity with our other funding partners to figure out what's the best strategy to ensure that there's resources available over the generation that we're going to be there and then what's going to happen, not that we're ever gonna do this, at some point when we decide to move on to someplace else. So those are really key questions that we have to ask and I'm glad you brought it up because it's something that we struggle with within philanthropy on a regular basis. Yeah, so when you mentioned that you have, you've had conversations in the last year, you had 1,600. Yes. Conversation. Yes. Is that right? Yes. It was a all hands on deck. It's pretty. Where all of us, from our leadership to our program officers to our support staff, went to our places and said, let's have an honest conversation. You know, here's a strategy that we're thinking we want to put forward. Give us feedback. And we got a lot of feedback, and that has impacted what we're going to do moving forward. And I think, you know, your point, just mm -hmm. your point about not working necessarily with regional or community based mm -hmm. community foundations. Yes. Right, yes. community foundations, there are you know, tens of thousands of community foundations in the United States, and they're very, very close to the work. Yes. And I don't think we always coordinate with them. And, and oftentimes, the issues they're involved in are health, education, mm -hmm. you know, basic yep. poverty issues. So mm -hmm. there's probably a high chance that they're doing work related to us. Sarah, please. Yeah, I was just gonna add, I mean, as, um, as an organization that has certainly done its fair share of you know, putting out the RFP and listing interested parties to come and make our solution, you know, what they need for their problem. Um, I do think, uh, you know, we, we've also learned a lot of lessons from that approach. Um, and I, I don't think it's an either or, it's yeah. just, um, you, you know, for example, in the innovation space where um, there are new things and new ideas and new models uh, and approaches that are not necessarily going to be restricted to whatever geography you pick. That kind of RFP approach, RFP approach to sort of mm -hmm. solicit where is innovation happening, what what do we all need to see and, and help kind of light on be a really effective way to actually democratize the opportunity, get access to resources. Um, and then on the other hand, when we are trying to really reach the population and, and uh, build the capacity of a place to ultimately you know, reach its own um, goals, that's where you know, that kind of approach is less helpful. So I think, I think we have different, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, different tools in our, our toolkit, different purposes, and that both are, are needed. Um, you know, we too are focused a lot on just learning from our past um, experience in uh, being probably too technocratic in cases and solutions um, versus really help uh, actors on the ground diagnose problems and then provide, you know, as a national funder um, with access to knowledge and tools and supports uh, the right solution at the right time. So we, we are trying to approach that differently. I, I, one example I'll just give is uh, in the supports that we're providing in, in various states to help uh, build community engagement around the SSA and uh, the review processes that are underway around how states are really designing new accountability systems. Um, we've made a grant available for local organizations mm -hmm. to really build their patients really participate in that process. So for example, in uh, America, mm -hmm. where it's you know it's a it's it's an equity focused organization that otherwise may might not have been in the process. Um, so mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing we're starting to try to do a lot more is to really reach out to a much broader set of stakeholders in the um, provide capacity building, around, you know things that other foundations might not fund. Like so, I think we have a lot of um, teachers uh, and school leaders in the audience. I see a, just a raise of hands. 
Who's an, who's an educator or a school leader in the audience? So we should talk about that. You know, um, a few of us support educators and school leaders. It'd be interesting to hear, you know, Carla, particularly Sarah, um, how you think about educators in terms of you know, manifesting our goal here of equity in education. How do they come in? How do you support them? Well, I mean, I think, you know, if you think about student experience, uh, you know, even in a given high school, there are probably 10,000 interactions with adults and kids every single day. Um, and all of those experiences add up to, to you know, a, a, a sense of belonging, identity, um, impact that a child can have. And so educators obviously play this incredibly important role um, in building an equitable system and in supporting students. So how do we help all educators be able to do that well and to manage the interactions in the best possible way um, is, you know, a theme of our work around teacher support. Uh, you know, part of that is just giving teachers the tools they need to allow students, you know, them to serve all of the diverse needs in their classroom, where our initiative around personal learning, for example, where you're creating much more nimble, adept curricular tools and resources for, for to be able to truly meet the needs of their English language who are behind students who are ahead, um, given the incredible range of um, of outcomes that they might face in a given classroom, but also in thinking about school climate and the role that leadership plays. Um, you know, similar to Carla's example, creating the right structures in schools for collaboration uh, that's student-focused, but also intended to focus on instruction. Um, so we also are funding a lot of work, professional learning um, models that can bring together relevant. Uh, curricular sources with pedagogical practice and uh, in collaborative formats using student work to inform the data that teachers have. So there's a lot of work going on mm. across the country mm. to, to really try to put all these together in schools and schools really are the unit of change around this uh, and so we have to think about how do we really get down to the school level in and like the examples that I talked before we're really about that pre-service and in-service and figuring out how we can support teachers in their practice in the moment and not have it to be more of a reflective look back on the year, but more what are the supports that you need throughout the year in order to be successful. And much of what Sarah said, we support also through our grant making. And we're always looking for new ways in which to support teachers and principal leadership. And for the longest time, we only focused on teachers, and then we learned that, you know, we could put all the supports or supp help support teachers to the best of their ability, but if their school leader or their building leader doesn't quite align, it doesn't really help support what they need to do. And so we decided to focus on principal leadership. And now we're looking at what can we do to, in the institutes of higher education so that what teachers are experiencing in the classroom go back into their pre-service so that they are better prepared for what they're going to face in the classroom. And so beginning to have those, those conversations with the higher ed institutions and the, their consortium and associations around what does the 21st century teacher need in order to be successful? And those are some of the ways that we're exploring some funding opportunities now. Fantastic. So I'm going to go to some questions that are coming through. We've got a bunch that are highly ranked. Uh, many folks have said, yes, this is a question I want to ask. So here's a question. It's a great one. As you think about the state of equity-focused nonprofits today, so this could be your grantees or mm -hmm. partners that we're working with, what is the one thing you wish they would do differently? So we just had this conversation <laughs> with at the Kellogg Foundation because we hosted a Truth and Racial Healing and Transformation Forum in December all around how can we bring communities together so that they can be empowered to deal with some of the inequities that they have. And so 500 people came together in California. We spent four days together doing deep dives around what are some of the things that are plaguing our communities and what are the ways in which we can get together. And so we found that most folks were not having the conversation. Everyone was having a one-off conversation or competing for funds in order to be able to do their work. 
and that they needed a forum to get together to have conversations, to do intentional planning. And from that conversation in December, it led to us saying, we're gonna support communities who self-identify across the country by giving them seed money so that they can have these conversations, develop their community plans around equity, get the training and the support that they need so that they can combat whatever issue they've identified in their local community, and we will partner to ensure that they have those resources available. And so now we have communities showing up in Washington and Baltimore and Chicago and in the South where folks are talking for the first time with their state officials and their legislature and their police forces around what are the things that are prohibiting us from having an equitable and just society. And they're putting their plans together now because they want to do some really intensive work over the next few years around breaking down these structural barriers. That's great. Mm -hmm. So I'd say two things. Um, first, listen to the people that, that you seek to benefit. Uh, Put young, you know, put young people's voices much, much more at the center. Ask them. Understand whether what you're doing is meeting their needs or not meeting their needs. And second, be willing to collaborate with each other. I think the point that you made about competition is a really serious problem all across the country. You know, almost anyone can get enough money to start an organization or to start something. It's much, much harder to say, actually, somebody else is better at doing that thing than I am, and I'm going to support them in doing that. I think we also, as funders, need to change how we work, and we have, um, I think for doing this kind of work in equity, it's, it's multi-year work, it's generational work, and so for funders that put out grants in one or two year um, chunks and don't really think about the underlying strength and health of the organizations that they're funding, we're not helping you do the hard work that you're trying to do, so we are trying to shift our funding to be much more multi-year, uh, to allow much more general support rather than project support. Because we're doing this kind of work, um, it's going to require that. But then it requires a great deal of trust and talking um, back and forth with each other. So those would be my, my, my Thank thoughts. Thank you, Sir? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think we're a little more focused on um, our partners and grantees, perhaps not as excellent as um, those that are. Um, but perhaps I was building on Hillary's point. Um, uh, emphasize the idea of not um, not being afraid to highlight the capacity that's needed. Uh, yeah. You know, many nonprofit mm -hmm. leaders are you know, so incredibly mission driven that and are moving a million miles an hour, and um, and then we also may respond in project based ways and want to fund things when if we truly want these organizations to have an impact, to be able to scale, and mm -hmm. that requires um, capacity. Mm -hmm. And I think for funders too, being really willing to be flexible in how we think about doing our so that organizations, particularly those that are coming out of um, less advantaged communities, have access to the social capital they need to really build sustainable organizations over uh, And what role can we play? So I think that it's sort of a partnership yeah. around being willing to have those conversations. Uh, and it doesn't mean you're admitting that you're a weak organization uh, to, to be able to call out you need some support in this organizational area. Uh, and, and so what we can do to build those kind of conversations around what, what a shared mm -hmm. goal really looks like is important. You know, I, I would just underline that. Um, you know, when I've seen the relationship between a, a grantee, or, you know, a partner and a funder really excel is when there's a very truthful, authentic yes. relationship. And that's, I know it's hard because there are power dynamics there, but you know, this work is so important. This work is so important, and I've seen, you know, when a grantee, you know, is candid, and, you know, candid to us, and, you know, I talked to a couple grantees that were focused on equity issues, and they said, you know, the thing that I like is that I, we can call you up, we can tell you the truth, and we appreciate that, and you listen. Um, we have to do more of that. The other thing I would say is that there is, this is within philanthropy at large, there is kind of a hero complex, right, where a nonprofit who's funded, you know, wants to do all that work on its own and sort of, you know, hit the metrics. But we know, particularly in this work that's so systems focused, that it really requires a tremendous amount of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So we need to hear about that. And that collaboration takes time and energy to actually produce. And actually that sort of collaborative infrastructure 
is expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to hear that. If we don't hear that, then you're working on Sunday night and we don't know it. So again, just to kind of, I think all of us are saying it's, it's the authentic relationship. Um, we've got just a few more minutes. We've got a couple of other questions here. One, which I'm not surprised about, uh, which is popping up toward the top, is that, you know, historically we have relied upon the federal government as a major partner in working. Any thoughts about the current administration, what you're thinking about? Um, you know, for us, I think it's, you know, kind of wait and see. And, um, you know, it, this is important, you know, I, uh, but it's kind of wait and see. We're not exactly sure, but I'm curious about how you react to the issue of the current administration, anything that you want to mention. So I think we take the same approach. I mean, we've been in existence for 85 years, so there's been lots of administrative changes, some that are fully supportive of the grant-making activities that we support, and some who, they're not resistant to it, but it's not the top priority. For, at the Kellogg Foundation, we're always holding children at the center. And so we'll work with anyone who holds children at the center. We're going to continue to advocate and leverage the voices of what children need in order to be successful. And so we've, had an, we've already had many initial conversations with our current Trump administration around where the Kellogg Foundation value set is and what is it that we hope to have for children. And we're going to continue to have those conversations. We have a lot of conversations with state leadership around the Kellogg value set and what is it that we hope to have for children. And we're going to continue those conversations because that's the role that we play in philanthropy. We amplify the voices of the communities that we're serving and we hold that role very seriously. And so for us, it's around doubling down on the things that are important and pushing forward and trying to get others to recognize the importance of investing in children young and early. And so we're going to continue to do that. Thank you, Carla. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think we have a wait and see attitude as well. I think um, we feel like it's really, really important for facts and evidence not to get lost mm -hmm. um, in this period of time and, uh, and for the voices of the communities um, that we all seek to serve and seek to benefit. And that's a complicated, that's a complicated, complicated. path. Um, we right now, while we wait and see some of how things will settle, um, are doubling down on other aspects of what our foundation funds, so a lot more investment in um, investigative journalism and in um, looking at how to um, think about the misinformation um, kinds of things that are out there and disrupt that. And then we, we do fund, um, we're one of the largest funders of the ACLU and of Planned Parenthood and of the Dreamers and of Black Lives Matter. And so we're, we're doubling down on that because we think that any healthy society needs debate and yes. needs dissent and um, uh, as well as compromise and, uh, mm -hmm. and collaboration. Thank you. Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I think in the next few years, obviously, it's really important to stay engaged, um, stay deep engaged at multiple levels, all in state. Um, from the education, a K-12 standpoint at least, there's tremendous work to be done at the state and local level um, that you know, we have an opportunity to really stay the and really a lot of local authority to do that work. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind, regardless of what federally. And then I think what, what we're thinking a lot about is how do we to build the capacity of different advocacy mm -hmm. and other community mm -hmm. organizations to really be able to have voice uh, and be heard. That's a really uh, important part. So last question. We've got just a few more minutes. And again, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because we talked a little bit about the sense around us collaborating, not just us on the stage, but other funders collaborating. But the question is, how can foundations and new age investors, which I guess means could be individuals, could be uh, impact investors, could mm -hmm. be companies, could be a whole range of, of actors, work together to mac maximize our effectiveness? We talked before mm -hmm. that we need to share, yeah. right? Earlier on, not just when we're actually, you know, me telling you, hey, we're yeah. going to do this. Mm -hmm. Would you like to join? Which is bad behavior. Yes, it is. But we do it often, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, but we actually have to, in, in our refresh, right, all of us go through a strategy refresh every mm -hmm. year. All of us, every three to five years, we kind of build our strategies. Mm -hmm. We need to talk with each other to hear what you're learning, so how we can kind of dock on. 
Um, but I think the question is also beyond the big institutional funders. You know, there's a lot of folks who want to get, you know, there's a lot of interesting entrepreneurs out there, social entrepreneurs who want to get involved in education and make a difference. So how can we help them? How can we work with them? We actually have a, a philanthropic partnerships initiative um, that's relatively, it's been around in various yeah. incarnations for a number of years, but it's, mm -hmm. it's really taking on um, much more sort of uh, big presence for us. And, uh, you know, I've, you've all heard of things like the Giving Pledge, uh, mm -hmm. which is sort of the highest end of that uh, spectrum of givers. Uh, but but our, our team really is focused also on thinking about how to cultivate relationships with local funders, uh, high net worth individuals or, or community mm -hmm. leaders. Um, and, and think about what are the kinds of things that we can do to strengthen their ability to have impact, whether it's learning opportunities, knowledge sharing, access to research, or just um, you know, local funder collaboratives, that kind of thing. Um, and the more we do that, the, the higher impact we're all, we're all gonna experience. So it is a real priority for us. I, it takes different forms in different places, so there's no single answer uh, to get better at this. I do, I, I've been working with my team, just even tactically, how do we coordinate our learning agendas so that if we're, mm. you know, going and experiencing something amazing in a place, why aren't we inviting others along on the journey with us so that we can be learning in real time together? Um, mm. Is one thing I think we could probably do a lot um, more of, and it's not that hard to do. So, particularly with our place-based work, where different foundations mm. ships together mm. and together and build greater. And I, last year, I spent some time doing a tour of Silicon Valley, talking to some of the tech firms around, you know, their social impact and how they want to get involved in the sorts of things that they want to use and be a part of in order to make change, particularly around social justice. And, you know, for, I know how to use a phone, but that's pretty much about it. They had some really good ideas that I think and having those conversations have made us think about how we're engaging communities very differently. And so we've been able to partner with some who have helped us to develop an online platform so that, that we call Connected Communities, where we can bring folks together who are both within our grant-making portfolios, but just communities at large to have larger conversations around what we're doing, what are some of the opportunities around innovation that we could seed fund, ways in which we can think about restructuring some of our mission-driven investments and our program-related investments so that we have more of an enterprise sort of innovation pool of resources available and partner. We've you know, co-sponsored some competitions around education to figure out some new innovative ideas. We've thought about crowdfunding for certain other aspects of education reform. And so having these conversations, and they've been really recent conversation, has helped us think about what is philanthropy and what does it look like in the 21st century. And I think we have a long way to go, but I'm glad to see that that non-traditional partnership is a way in which we can continue to collaborate. Yeah, I, I think I would say, um, in addition to, yes, everything, hmm. what, um, what they have said, to constantly ask ourselves, whose voices are we not hearing? Yeah. You know, who are we missing and how do we bring them into the conversation? Who's not here? Um, and then we are also partnering with Kellogg on something called Fund for Shared Insight, yeah. which is systematically trying to create feedback loops from the people that our foundations exist to benefit. And so things like Youth Truth, which is a way of working, you know, getting um, input from students in schools about their school climate, and uh, you know, and, and um, uh, the mothers who are in things like Nurse mm -hmm. Family Partnership. So there's so many things that that people who use the systems that we all work in can tell us about how to make them work better. Um, we're experimenting with the Net Promoter Score, with um, SurveyMonkey, you know, which is that, would you recommend this to mm -hmm. someone else? And it turns out that some of the early feedback that you can get from users about whether or not their experience is positive um, are actually pretty strongly correlated with then the later kinds of more rigorous um, evaluations that are done yeah. of program effectiveness. So um, I think that's, that's a potential kind of strategy. So we end on the note of, of innovation. And I think, you know, non-traditional partners, we need to move in that direction for sure. Um, I want to thank each of our panelists for this great conversation. I think this is the start. We need to be doing more collaboration, right? Thank you. And thank you.